Hi everybody. So diving in a little bit more to the micro to the microbiota, um, based off of that psychobiotic revolution book that I read. Um, we're just kind of going to go through part two of that in this video. So we're going to go into gut dysbiosis and the microbiota throughout your life. So your microbiota is as unique to you as your fingerprints. Not everyone's going to have the same exact one. So it's kind of unlikely that any single probiotic um, or psychobiotic is going to work for everyone. You need to kind of experiment and see what works best for you. Um, there are 100 trillion bacteria in your gut. There's a ton. Um, composed of at least 500 different species, but the bulk of them, like 98%, um, come from about 40 species that are divided into just the four big groups. And the two main ones are the lactobacillus and the bifidobacteria. Um, those are what you're gonna find in a lot of mainstream probiotics. Uh, gut microbes produce all manner of chemicals to talk with each other and to your gut. That information is then relayed to your brain, primarily via the vagus nerve, which is a long winding nerve. Um, from your brain to all your organs. It's also the nerve um, that you need to try and calm down. Um, if you've ever like iced your vagus nerve, which is right here, um, at least goes down this way. Um, kind of helps also with like panic and anxiety and things like that, kind of brings you back to ground. Um, so that's that same nerve. Uh, the problem with the communication is that sometimes it has a lot of few words going from like your stomach and your intestinal system to your brain. Um, normally it's like, I'm good. I'm good, I'm good, now I'm hungry, now I'm really hungry, now I'm super full, and now I'm good. Um, and that's really kind of all we get. So kind of how that works is there's some microbes, especially the bifido species, which is super friendly, um, they produce butyrate, and that feeds and heals the lining of your gut. Butyrate can make its way to the brain where it can induce good mood, dampen inflammation, or encourage the production of the brain growth hormone. All these changes can improve your mood and even help you to think better. Now, when we talk about sugar cravings, which a lot of people have, um, they can be seen as a consequence of a dysbiotic gut. Um, it's likely related to the sugar um, cravings of people in mental hospitals as well, they found that. Sugar cravings have also been seen in people who are like really, really, really stressed. So again, that vagus nerve, we wanna make sure that that chills out because it goes both ways. Um, if you're anxious here, you may be anxious here, anxious here, anxious here. Um, these are more than likely pathogens though that are making you crave that, which is why your gut is potentially in dysbiosis, but the thing is, is the same principles can apply to just your regular commensal bacteria that you've got going on. If they don't get what they want, they're going to make a fuss, and when that happens, you may not know it directly, but they'll have ways of making you feel uncomfortable until you give them what they want. It's kind of like a funky feeling that makes you suddenly crave a candy bar or another snack. Remember, your cravings may not necessarily be what you want, but what your gut bacteria want. Um and it's really quickly becomes your job to fill it. That's why cravings come on so hard and you have, um, a lot of people think it's a self-control problem, but it really isn't. Um, if your gut is healthy, there's gonna be a cosmopolitan bustle of microbes with no one species dominating over the other. They just kind of live in harmony in that homeostasis. Um, no one has too much control over another. Um, again, otherwise it's going to cause a dysbiotic gut, which is going to have a lot less diversity. And the less diverse it is, including your diet, the more issues that you're going to have. Um, so let's look at kind of starting with like mom and baby, how the microbiota throughout your life works. So you are kind of swathed in a bacterial blanket before you ever poke your head out of the womb, unless you get violently ill or end up on an antibiotic regimen in the first days of your existence, your body will form a memory of this first bacterial initiation uh, that will likely last for the rest of your life. So the bacterial appetizer is all there, among other reasons, to teach your immune system what to expect. Uh, for those of us born C-section, like myself, um, we miss a lot of the messy stuff. Uh, instead, we were whisked away to a nursery where we're picked up uh, the bacterial population more unique to our nurse and to our hospital versus to our own moms. Um, some studies have shown that children delivered by C-section may lack important bacterioids species for up to the first 18 months of life, making them more likely to suffer from asthma, from allergies. Um, not all studies are like super, super depressing though. Um, there is some new research showing that around six weeks, uh, the microbiota of the children were normalized due to breastfeeding. So that is a way to kind of help reintroduce more good bacteria if you do have a child born C-section and not vaginally. Um, there is also kind of another 
hypothesis and observation is called the hygiene hypothesis for the people that keep everything really, really clean all the time. Um, it implies that cleanliness actually has a negative influence on normal development and it has a big impact on how people look at bacteria. So rather than being pathogenic or at best marginally useful, a certain set of bacteria may actually be essential for the proper development of your body's defenses. It is the job of these microbes to train your immune system and without them, your system stays naive and prone to overreaction. Remember, bacteria are important. We don't wanna live super clean or super dirty. We gotta find a happy medium. So let's jump a little bit back to mom and baby. So breast milk like I said, is a really good kind of indicator. It is both a prebiotic and a probiotic drink, a combination of microbes and the food that the microbes want. So that's pre and probiotic. Um, they not only feed, they're not only feed for the starter microbiota, but they reduce the and release uh, the stress hormone cortisol, keeping you happy and content. Uh, the first milk produced right after delivery, so colostrum, is packed with hundreds of species of bacteria, and it's also full of maternal white blood cells and antibodies to help establish a newborn's foundational immune system, kind of uh, like an immune system transplant designed to provide instant protection for like the baby's defenseless body. Um, the milk is filled with regulatory cells called Tregs, and they are important players kind of in immunity um, as a baby, your thymus is highly active while you build up your own unique collection of antibodies and Tregs. And as you get older, the thymus kind of shrivels and you might find it a little bit harder to fight off pathogens. That can lead to chronic inflammation and depression as you age. At around six months of breastfeeding, the bacteria in mom's milk start to change instead of the bacteria that are ex uh, kind of expert at digesting milk sugars. Um, the new microbiota in the milk starts to look a lot like your oral bacteria of mom. Um, that kind of helps the baby get ready for a solid food transition. During the early years of life, your immune system needs to be educated to leave your protective bacteria alone. So again, that was initial bacteria that you get when you're first born. That, that set is going to stay with you forever. So we want to make sure that we protect it and we don't harm it um, and kind of train it so that we always have that base layer. Um, if your immune system kills your guardian bacteria, again, that protective bacteria, the pathogens will directly attack your gut and they can eat holes in your gut lining, letting bacteria into your bloodstream and provoking an immune response. Although the basic framework of your microbiota is set by H2, it's still kind of a dynamic situation. As you grow, there will be changes and an overall kind of drift away from the bifido species. Teenage diets, typically laughable, lead to a rash of gut problems and the stress affects the teenage brain and the microbiota. Like again, stress, not good for us, not for, good for a microbiota, not good for inflammation. Um, there is good news and bad. You can make a difference because this may be the last time in your life that you can make durable changes to your microbiota, which is in your teenage years. Um, but if a bad set of microbes gets established, you may have to fight for the rest of your life to keep the upper hand. So if you were like really sick as a kid, or if like you were on a constant flow of antibiotics for some reason as a teenager, I was both. Um, and now I have terrible gut health and I'm working on that, but, um, you know, fighting to keep the upper hand always. It's never really too, too late. Uh, just make sure that you're eating a really good diet to keep your gut healthy, increase your health span, improve your mood all at the same time and I'll go more into that next week as well but that is just a little bit on gut dysbiosis and microbiota throughout your life.